In this lecture, we're going to be discussing uh, substance abuse disorders, and this is going to be your last substance abuse disorder lecture. So we're going to discuss hallucinogens. Now, we've already discussed CNS stimulants and depressants in our previous uh, lectures, so if you guys want to see them, go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash madmedicine, and there you can find a playlist titled Psychiatry for Step 1, and you can watch all of uh, the Step 1 psych videos, including the substance abuse videos. Uh, that we talked about earlier. Now, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe while you're on the channel. It'll help us out. And with that being said, let's talk about hallucinogens. Hallucinogens are just psychoactive agents that cause hallucinations. That's the hallmark uh, symptoms that happen with the hallucinogens. Now, these can often often occur with uh, other perceptual anomalies, but we're going to talk about these changes as we continue on with this lecture. Now, the hallucinogens that you need to know for step one are gonna be LSD, marijuana, and uh, a lot of you guys might be wondering why is marijuana on the hallucinogen list and not on a CNS depressant list, and we'll talk about that. But we're also gonna discuss MDMA, AKA street drug ecstasy, and uh, PCP. Anyways, so we're gonna talk about PCP as well. Okay, so let's talk about LSD also known as lysergic acid diethylamide. This is a hallucinogen and it is not a stimulant, surprisingly so, even though it makes you kind of happy. Uh, the mechanism of action is unknown and that's great because you guys don't need to know about that for step one. No one knows it, so you don't need to know it. Uh, but this does have several hallmark intoxicating effects and uh, presentations. So the very hallmark intoxication uh, side effect of LSD is going to be hallucinations and these are usually going to be visual and or auditory hallucination something like this gif right here this is what a visual hallucination might look like patients will also complain of depersonalizing and just detaching from themselves and looking at themselves from a third person point of view they may complain of psychosis as well as positive flashbacks and uh, the main thing you might want to watch out for someone who is tripping on LSD is gonna be anxiety and paranoia those patients are having a very bad trip and uh, that's one hallmark thing you need to be aware of when it comes to step one now fun fact, I have heard, not from first-hand experience, but I've heard from several people that when someone's tripping on LSD, you tell them never to look in the mirror. Because apparently, and this may be hearsay, but apparently when they look at themselves in the mirror, they see their face melting. So if you guys have done LSD, please let me know uh, what you saw. No, sorry, let me take that back. If you have done LSD and you have looked in the mirror, uh, let me know what you saw. I'm just curious. Anyways, the treatment for this is just going to be supportive care. It's not much you can do for someone who's tripping. You just can hope that they're having a good trip instead of a bad trip. And uh, yeah, that's LSD in a nutshell. The next thing we need to discuss is marijuana. Marijuana, uh, grass, green, ganja, cannabis, etc. Et now This is derived from the cannabis plant. A lot of people get confused with marijuana and hemp. They both are derived from the cannabis plant, but hemp is like the fibrous remains. Marijuana comes from the bud. Uh, or the flower. That's what marijuana is. Now, marijuana does have psychoactive uh, uh, activity, and it's all because of one substance called tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. Okay, this is the psychoactive component of marijuana, and that's what you need to know for step one. What it does is that it stimulates the cannabinoid receptors in the CNS. Man, your brain is just wired to get high. <laughs> so it stimulates the cannabinoid receptors. THC is the main psychoactive portion of marijuana. Now, when it comes to marijuana, I'm sure you guys understand what happens. Uh, intoxicating effects are going to include euphoria, like this boy right here. We got Elon Musk. It's going to include euphoria. Patients are going to complain or say they get very hungry. Uh, they get the munchies. So let's just write that down. Munchies. Boom. Uh, they may present with ataxia and slurred speech. Okay, They're also going to have impaired judgment and cognition as well as reduced anxiety. And often it's used for anxiety. A lot of people use it off-label for anxiety. Now, withdrawal symptoms are just going to be the opposite of mar uh, marijuana intoxication. They're going to be irritable, anxious, depressed, insomniac, restless, etc., etc. But they are still going to have increased uh, appetite because they got the munchies. They got the munchies. Now, surprisingly, there is a form of marijuana that's used medically, and uh, this is a synthetic cannabinoid, also known as dronabol. 
uh, dronabinol, sorry, <laughs> is known as dronabinol. Dronabinol is a, a chemotherapeutic uh, drug which is used for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Right, so it's not a sorry, it's not a chemotherapeutic drug. Uh, it's used for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. This is not chemo. This is used for treatment of the side effects for chemo. And what it leads to is appetite stimulation in HIV and AIDS patients as well as end-stage patients. And a lot of oncologists might also prescribe marijuana, medical marijuana, specifically to increase the patient's uh, uh, appetite, right? Because it leads to increased appetite as well as reducing some of their pain and anxiety that's associated with cancer. So that's why marijuana is considered a psychoactive drug. It's considered a hallucinogenic drug not just uh, a CNS depressant like you may be thinking, like I thought too. So that's marijuana. We're going to talk about now methyl, uh, and methyl N-dioxy methamphetamine, MDMA, a.k.a. Exity. Ex oh, I, can't say, I can't say this. Ecstasy. Man, that was a hard one. Uh, MDMA ecstasy is a type of amphetamine, which means uh, what it's going to lead to is an increase in serotonin and an inhibition of serotonin reuptake. It kind of, in my opinion, it kind of acts like an SSRI, but not exactly. It doesn't have the same effect. But what it does is that it leads to an increase in serotonin. All right, or also known as 5-HT. That's what's happening with, uh, with MDMA. That's what gives you the euphoric feeling. Now, when someone is intoxicated, they're going to have euphoria, alertness, but also they're going to have bruxism. Bruxism is teeth grinding. So they're going to have bruxism when it comes to uh, MDMA. They're also going to have several life-threatening effects. Now, keep in mind, because this is an amphetamine, this is technically also a C and as stimulant, and as such, because it's going to be stimulating their brain, uh, it's going to lead to tachycardia and hypertension. It will also lead to hyper hyperthermia and hyponatremia because it's going to increase fluid and ADH, which is important to know. MDMA will lead to increased ADH as well as being hepatotoxic. So you want to watch out for drugs that uh, might interact with this. Right. So if you get a question with someone who is taking, let's say, uh, a drug and uh, they end up having severe side effects and then you find out they're taking uh, MDMA or ecstasy along with that drug, it's probably because uh, MDMA is leading to hepatotoxicity. Now, when it comes to withdrawal, these patients are going to suffer from a crash uh, right after the withdrawal. What that means is that they're going to suffer from anxiety, uh, depression, loss of attention and appetite. They may be fatigued and lethargic and they may complain of jaw pain because of the bruxism that they were, uh, they were having while they were intoxicated. So that covers uh, ecstasy. And finally, the last hallucinogen that you need to know for step one is fencyclidine, aka PCP, aka angel dust, aka uh, what people say uh, causes extreme roid, uh, road rage, right? Or like roid, uh, roid temper, like when they're on steroids, but like to the hundredth degree. People who are on PCP uh, have very uncontrolled bouts of anger. We're going to talk about that in a second. But... But the main thing you need to know about PCP is that it is an NMDA receptor antagonist, okay? That's what it does. It antagonizes or it blocks the NMDA receptors. And what that ends up happening, what ends up happening because of that is the intoxicating effects of PCP. Patients are going to present with stimul uh, uh, an altered mental status with a stimulant capability, Right? That's what ends up happening with PCP. So these patients will become psychotic with hallucinations, okay? and they're going to become violent and agitated. And that's why we have this gif right here of Zach looking all angry, Zach Galifianakis looking all angry uh, from one of his major videos. I forget which one. Anyways, uh, that's what it looks like. These patients get very, very angry. And the crazy thing is they're going to have loss of painful stimuli. So you may have heard about stories about people who end up picking up cars or uh, a policeman tries to you know, gun them down. 
down because they get scared or they try to tase them, but that person just isn't phased by any of them. They keep charging. They seem, uh, they, it seems like they have no painful stimuli whatsoever. It's probably because they're all angel dust or PCP. Right. Uh, it, it does have stimulant capabilities. That's why most people take it, but it also alters their mental status and makes them really angry. And uh, if you see a person or a patient presenting with these classic signs and symptoms, you need to think about PCP intoxication. They're also going to have sympathetic stimulation, just like every other stimulant. So it's going to lead to tachycardia, hypertension. One other thing to understand is they're going to have nystagmus, which is different from all the other drugs and uh, uh, substances that we've been discussing. We've been mainly discussing mydriasis and uh, uh, myhydriasis. But in this case, patients are all going to suffer from uh, nystagmus, okay? And they're also going to have coma and seizures, which are kind of rare. Now, the possibilities of patients dying from this drug are pretty high because the fatalities are usually caused by trauma. Because they're so angry, because they're so stimulated, they're going to most likely cause some sort of, some sort of incident, right? Uh, because of psychosis and loss of pain, which is going to cause them to dissociate and uh, it may lead to death from several different ways. It could be police, it could be uh, cardiac induced, right? Because you have sympathetic stimulation also occurring. So it's, it's a very dangerous drug. I think one of the most dangerous out of all of these drugs that we've been discussing so far. Now, treatment for PCP is going to uh, consist of a two prong approach. The first prong is going to consist of benzos. This is going to be a depressant, right? So this is going to deal with the stimulant capabilities, the capacity. So this is going to take away the stimulation portion. And then the second part is going to be haloperidol, which is an antipsychotic medication that's going to take care of the altered mental status. By using these two drugs, you're going to be able to wean someone off a of PCP slowly, making assuming they haven't harmed themselves or someone else uh, in the process of being intoxicated. Now, with that being said, our lecture is done. Thank you so much for listening to our, our talk today. If you guys don't know, uh, we also have these lectures available as a podcast for free on all the major podcast services. Just search Mad Medicine and you can find them. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel on our YouTube uh, site. Thank you so much and continue on to the next topic.